Good afternoon and welcome back to NASA's Johnson Space Center for our post-mission management team meeting briefing. This is the flight day three of the STS-134 space shuttle mission to the International Space Station. So for the briefing, we have opening comments from Leroy Kane, who was the chairman of the MMT meeting and also is the deputy program manager for the space shuttle. And then we'll take questions. Leroy. Thank you, Kylie. It's good to be back with you today. Uh, we've had another uh, spectacular day on orbit with the Endeavour and, and crew. Um, I know you've been briefed on the uh, on the rendezvous and docking, which was uh, which was flawless and and uh, um, and went very well. Um, the uh, crew got on um, after that with uh, with the Express Logistics Carrier operations and and all of that went very well. Also, um, and they rounded out their day with uh, with uh, some other activities that were on the timeline. They're sleeping now um, on orbit. The shuttle crew is sleeping. And um, so things have gone really well um, since we were last here. And uh, um, the, the vehicle continues to perform uh, very well as well. Um, the, uh, in the MMT today, we had a couple of items to talk about. Um, and I'll just briefly mention a few of those. We did get uh, all of the uh, RPM photos on the ground. And so the team has been pouring over that data. And we have a good bit of that um, assessment to complete yet. Um, but they brought in a status of that, and, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the, uh, the wing leading edge system that, that you're aware of that we use primarily for ascent um, to give us any indications of impacts, um, we turn that on periodically when we're on orbit. And um, the team reported we, we didn't have any reportable items from any of the on orbit monitoring periods that it's been on so far. So, so that was uh, that was summarized today as well. Um, the next time that that system will be active will be during the uh, Soyuz undock activity on Monday, currently scheduled on Monday. Um, the uh, the leading edge support system, um, the reinforced carbon carbon team um, looked at all of their data from the flight day two inspections um, and all of the other imagery and and. Uh, um, data that they have to look at and analyze, and they've determined that they don't have any regions of interest where we need to go look at any more detail. And so we've essentially cleared the, the wing leading edge, um, and they were able to, to brief us on that today as well. Um, the, uh, where other imagery and, and assets are concerned, we, we're making good progress on the SRBs. Um, and uh, they'll be doing open assessment here in the next uh, 24 hours, and we expect to get some video by about this time tomorrow, if not sooner, the, the video will be on the servers for the solid rocket booster videos. And so we look forward to that. Um, the, uh, the team came in and did the ascent quick look today. You know, that's where we do a very um, high level overview of all of the uh, various parameters from the, from the launch and the ascent and the vehicle performance. Um, to include the day of launch eye load assessment, uh, guidance, navigation, and control performance, um, the loads, the aero, the thermal, and uh, and they briefed us on that and 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 that quick look assessment. Um, the vehicle performance was very very good, no no issues or, or concerns, um, nothing poking out there that that we have uh, to talk about. So um, we got a good summary from from uh, the rest of the team on a few very minor systems issues, um, and uh, there, there isn't anything there that's going to be any impact to the mission. Um, they're uh, uh, very minor problems, and, and uh, so they'll continue to work through those if, if necessary. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the other status we got today was from the, the tile team, the damage assessment team, the DAT, as we refer to them. Um, they came in and they gave us their, their uh, assessment um, of where they are in looking at all the photo data, uh, the uh, photography data from the, the uh, RPM, uh, really all of the data that we have in-house um, as of now. And um, we have a, a few charts that I can show you to sort of summarize where we are as of now. Um, if we have them available, Kylie, we can show the first chart. Um, this chart just shows the, the, the bottom of the orbiter, obviously, in this graphic. Um, there are three boxes that are in yellow, and those are areas that um, we need to get. All of these areas, I should say, at the front, um, we, we are not finished assessing. We are in the process of assessing um, these areas as well as some others. Um, but these were ones of interest that the team wanted to show us today, and so we talked about them. 
Um, the ones in the yellow box are the ones that are at least initially of greater interest to us than the other ones. Um, and so I think we have a couple of charts to show you some more detail of the ones in yellow. Um, so we could go to that next first uh, chart. So in this site here, um, it's just a, a little bit more detailed close-up view. Um, and you can see where uh, the, uh, the white areas where we're missing the, the, the outer coating and, and perhaps more than that of the, of the uh, tile. Um, and this is one of the areas that, that the team is going to do some more work on uh, to determine whether or not there's any, any uh, other photography or, or inspection data that we need. Um, next chart. This is uh, the second of the yellow boxes, and, and if you I can't put both up at the same time, but if you kind of go back and forth between these detailed ones and the overall bottom of the orbiter chart, you can sort of remind yourself the position of these. So the one is uh, kind of an area between the the starboard landing gear door and the and the external tank door, um, uh, and then the other one is is actually on the main landing gear door, the starboard main landing gear door, and that's this one here. Um, and then the next chart, uh, <clears throat> this is actually an area that's on the, uh, on the Elevon itself. Um, and so it's, it crosses a couple of different tiles and then um, the very leading edge of it is actually the tile that's on the, on, kind of on the, what looks like the hinge line if you look in the bigger picture. Um, so these are three areas that, that are an example of some, some areas where the team wants to do some more work, some more assessment. Um, and uh, as a normal part of our process, they will go do that. Um, it, at this point, what we have said is that um, we don't have any reason for concern or alarm. Um, as you know, we have a focused inspection uh, uh, placeholder in the timeline, and, and that would be on flight day six, which is Saturday. Um, so what we've done is we've asked the ops team to go to the next level of preparation in terms of ensuring that we don't do anything to preclude being able to do that focus inspection if, in fact, the team comes back and says, our analytical techniques were not able to clear one or more of these sites, then we'll want to go get some more detailed photography and, and imagery of these sites, and then we can go do that. Um, so we're very much in, in the middle of this process. I wanted to show you today um, kind of the areas that that we're still working on. Um, overall, the, the vehicle's pretty clean in terms of number of total number of damage sites. Um, and these were, were a couple of the ones that we're going to look at in more detail and uh, going forward, determine whether or not there's anything else we need to do. So um, we, uh, we wrapped up with a discussion um, about the, uh, the undock, the Soyuz undock plans. Um, we will talk tomorrow morning in the space station program mission management team um, about, in some level of detail, between the shuttle and the station programs uh, and the supporting teams, we'll talk about what the plan is for the undock and, and getting the photography. Um, we will then carry that discussion forward to the, the, the shuttle MMT tomorrow afternoon and give the shuttle, the broader shuttle team, the benefit of, uh, of weighing in on, on, uh, on the plans there. And then we'll be prepared to go into Friday morning to the station program MMT again, um, where I believe that they are planning on doing the, uh, the undock, their standard undock go-no-go -no -go that they would do for any departing vehicle. Um, I believe they're planning on doing that, that on Friday. So uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about the timeline for that with the respective MMTs, and I, I didn't have enough detail on it yet. And uh, we do today. We know that that's the plan. And uh, so we look forward to those discussions. Um, so beyond that, um, the, the, uh, the team is doing great. The uh, crew on orbit is doing great. You can see that the vehicle performance is, is continuing to be very, very good, um, which helps us a lot in terms of being able to execute the mission. Um, we're looking forward to uh, the AMS activities uh, tomorrow, tonight, when the crew gets up. It'll start tonight, actually, but it'll be in earnest in the, in the wee hours of the morning tomorrow. So a lot of folks uh, are very excited about that, and we look forward to that. And um, another another exciting and, and uh, um, very productive day in orbit today, as I said. And uh, so with that, I think that's all I have got. Okay. We'll start with questions here at the Johnson Space Center. Mm -hmm. OK, come on. 
Uh, Mark Caro for Aviation Week. Um, I just wanted to ask you about part of the AMS uh, ops tomorrow. Uh, is there any sort of thermal clock that that is critical to the transfer on that piece of hardware, or could it stay longer on the arms if for some reason uh, you had a difficulty? Yeah, we have a clock, um, and uh, but I don't think that it's a situation where we have really credible scenarios that would cause us any concern with that. So um, we, we have the right actions in place if we should get into some kind of robotics contingency, but I, I think that's um, pretty unlikely. Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. Um, on the, the images that you showed us, um, what makes the three items that you were highlighting more of an interest or a, a priority in assessment? And then in the, the, the big picture with the, of the orbiter belly, is it possible that the, that damage track was perhaps a common cause or caused from some common event? Yeah, so um, on your first question, um, the, the individual sites, of course, the team will, um, they're very good at this, as you know, and they're very thorough and they're very disciplined and, and we will stay very much within our processes and within ourselves for doing these assessments. So we don't wanna get ahead of ourselves. Um, so each one of these sites is, is unique in that um, the tiles are, are different geometry, they're different thickness, they're in different regions of, of you know, uh, heating. Um, and so they're, they're each very specific in terms of their capabilities and, and they're specific in terms of the function of what it is that they need to, um, to protect from a, a thermal protection system. And so each damage area is unique also. It has different size, different overall um, you know, length, width, and depth, and different volume. And all of those things play into um, the function of the tile and, and if there's any, um, if there's anything to be studied in terms of, you know, whether there's a um, something of, of greater interest in one area than the next, so um, it it involves looking at um, aerodynamically what we think will happen at each one of the sites. Uh, obviously, thermal dynamically what will happen at each one of the sites, um, and then the overall interaction of, you know, from one site to the next, um, you know, what happens. Uh, with the flow. And so it gets pretty involved. Um, there, we take them individually and then you have to take it as an overall system as well. Um, these three areas are areas where um, generally there's a little more depth, we believe, preliminarily. There's a little more depth to the damage areas um, and or they're in areas where, um, you know, we have more, a greater interest because of the thermal um, effects. And so, um, you know, frankly, until we do some more analysis and until we get a little bit better fidelity on the, on the photography data, um, you know, we may change our mind on, on which, which site may, may be of greater interest than others. But at least initially, these are, these are the three areas that we think um, we want to go do some more work on. I should mention that work will, will be done, um, you know, probably in the next 24, 48 hours. Um, and, and there's a lot of, uh, there's some 3D analysis that will happen. Um, we have uh, experts in the photo labs. We'll do, some, uh, we'll do some analysis as well to try and help us with um, dimensions. The dimensional part of this is pretty important. Um, and then the aero and thermal folks will do a lot more work to determine whether or not um, you know, there's anything that they need more detail on uh, on any of their respective sites. Um, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. A um, couple questions. I know you keep a pretty good database of previous tile damage in areas like this. So, have you? Can you put it in context with uh, previous damage? And then, what is the heating on reentry in that area? Um, well, your first question, we, we do have uh, a very thorough and complete database. Um, it, it'd be premature for me to try to compare it 
because I don't think I know enough about any of these damage sites to be able to do that. Um, but the experts will do that for us. That that is, um, you know, one of the the um, the good things about this process is we we, you know, the team will bring in comparative analyses, comparative assessments, and we'll do, you know, we will leverage on our previous experience in, in previous areas that we've looked at. Um, so I can't tell you sitting here today, oh, this was like, you know, mission whatever on vehicle whatever. I, I it would that would all be guesswork. Um, so and the heating is different too um, at different places along the along the surface of the vehicle at different points during entry. So um, you know it's 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 in the the thousands of degrees, um, and depending on which site you're talking about, at what point during entry, uh, it's going to change. So. Um, We'll talk more about that as well as we talk through each one of these areas through the assessments. Is is what kind of um, what kind of heating do we see in these different areas, um, and uh, you know those details will be will be forthcoming as well. Clara Moskowitz with Space.com, and I'm just wondering um, if, given the unique history of the external tank that Endeavour launched with this time, if you're at all surprised that the vehicle is as clean as it does seem? No, I'm not surprised. I talked a little bit yesterday about the performance of the external tank, and uh, we did a lot of work on the tank, both uh, actual touch labor and, and with some modifications as well as uh, analytically. Um, and putting it side by side with our other return to flight tanks. And so um, not surprised. Uh, the performance was, was outstanding on this tank by all accounts. Um, we knew what areas we could expect in all likelihood to have some foam losses from. Um, and that's turning out to be the case. Um, and uh, so I think it's pretty much, um, if anything, better than our, our expectation. OK, I know we have. Uh Reporters on the phone bridge as well, so we'll go there next with Bill Harwood, please. Can you hear us, Bill Harwood? Yeah, hey, Leroy, can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thanks. Um, two, a couple of quick ones from me. Is there any sense of the timing on these? I mean, obviously the, the ET cam, there wasn't anything like this that was certainly obvious anyway. i uh, just wondering if you had any sense of when in that sense this might have happened. Not yet, Bill. We, we haven't been able to map anything that we're seeing in, in the uh, ascent video or imagery to, to damaged sites. I mean, we'll, we'll work on that as a matter of course because that's part of what we do in the process, but we, don't, we haven't been able to do that yet. Thanks. And uh, in looking at the, the ding on the, on the, I guess it's the starboard landing gear door, is that right? Um, it looked awfully similar to the one on 118 that you guys, uh, that was near the door anyway, and that I guess coincidentally, I guess Scott Kelly was the commander of. Um, <laughs> but you guys decided in that case it was okay to fly as is. I think it was right over a structural spar or something, gave you a bit of a thermal heat sink. Is there any special concern you can tell us about in terms of something directly on a landing gear door thermally? Thanks. Um. Yeah, your your recollection is good, Bill. We've had uh, a few flights where we've where we've had some areas that we looked at more closely. Um, STS-118 was one of those, um, and uh, in fact, one of the tiles. It's not one of the ones that we have um, in in the yellow blocks on the uh, on the graphic that I showed you. But one of the other ones is actually um, a tile that was also damaged on STS-118. Of course, it's a, a new tile, but it's the same tile location. Um, so there are some similarities, and, and, we, and we do, as I was mentioning earlier, we do leverage off of our database. Um, I don't know enough about the, uh, the damage on the landing gear door yet to be able to talk specifically about, um, about anything beyond uh, you know, what the team has given us so far, Bill. So I, I will have some more detail, obviously, that we can talk about that as we go forward and, and, uh, and determine exactly what um, you know, what the magnitude of the damage is and what, see what the analysis shows us. Okay, next on the line is Irene Klotz, please. Hi, um, thanks very much, Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, Leroy, I had a few questions. Uh, the first is, I hope this doesn't just show that I'm totally ignorant and haven't been following things, but I, I thought that the change of command um, from ISS on ISS was rotating between 
American and Russian, and I think that this change of command is going from Russian to Russian, and I understand this is probably a question for Bill Gerstenmaier, but do you have any insight into why that is? Uh, you're exactly right. That's a question for uh, for Gerst or for our my friends in the space station program. Uh, so we, we'll, uh, but I'm sure Kylie and and uh, our station friends can get you an answer on that. Okay. Thanks. Um, the, the other thing is, um, you know, um, based at Kennedy, there's uh, with every with every last. There's a big event, you know, last rollover, last hoisting, last everything. And I'm wondering if um, you all at Mission Control are getting a sense of wrapping things up with this uh, on the shuttle program. And, and in conjunction with that, if you could maybe discuss a little bit about how important this mission is for the overall long-term viability of space station after shuttle retirement. Okay, Irene. Well... Um, you know, as far as the last, um, I, what I would say about that is where, where Houston and, and Mission Control and, and, you know, that aspect of the shuttle program is concerned. Um, if you were to go over there today and immerse yourself um, with those folks and, and be part of what they're doing day to day, um, during a mission when we're executing, um, you, you would know uh, that there was anything like that going on. So um, it would be just as if you were going and sitting with them, you know, 10 years ago um, during a shuttle mission. Um, and, and it's one of the things that really needs to be heralded, I think, about this team um, across the entire program is that during this entire process, they have maintained a very high level of professionalism, integrity, um, their dedication to uh, the job has has been unwavering, um, and we see this in in all the organizations now, to include, uh, you know, the other centers, um, at uh, in particular at Kennedy and Marshall, um, as well as here, and um, so I, 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 my sense is you can't really tell a difference, um, you know, when we're when we're going about doing the execution of the mission, and uh, in this case, a shuttle dock mission with the station team. Um, so, you know, the mission itself is is very important, as you know, as we've, I think, chronicled leading up to this point. Um, it's, uh, you know, long time coming. A lot of folks are really anticipating the activities that we're about to get into tonight and tomorrow morning with, with AMS. I think that's huge. Um, and, and very important for folks, and, and, and really we ought to recognize um, the significance of that, uh, just that part of the mission in and of itself. And overall, obviously, from a, you know, the other activities that we're doing with the ELC um, and in terms of, of transfer activities and the normal um, kind of work that we do on shuttle station dock missions, it, it is very important at this point in the station's life. Um, and uh, uh, and, and the next one will be very important in that regard also. So um, it's difficult to say, you know, one is more important than the other because they're not created equal in most, in most regards. And so I, I wouldn't want to get into that realm of, of things. But um, very important mission uh, for, the, for the agency, um, certainly for us in the shuttle program. Um, and uh, as we've said now for the last couple of years, um, we're very, we're dedicated and determined to finish strong, and uh, and I think you see us doing that. We're we're doing everything we can, to uh, to uh, to stand by that. Um, and so far, I think this mission has been uh, consistent with that theme. So, um, important mission for us, and it, and it's going very very well. Thanks, Leroy. Um, the last question I had was about the 16-day um, mission. Is there any possibility of extending beyond that? Thank you. Well, you, you know, um, there's always a possibility. And, uh, you know, we, kn we know that uh, when we get on orbit, we try to take things from one day to the next. And we have a very good plan. The team has, has worked really hard on this plan. We can sort of plug and play these days, as I talked about yesterday a little bit, and the flight directors can give you more detail on that. Um, so far, um, we're not looking at doing that. Um, Irene, but you know, um, we certainly have the capability to do that. 
Uh, it's within our experience base to do that. Um, so between us and, and what the space station program uh, needs are as we go through the mission, you know, we'll take that one day at a time as we always do. And if we decide we want to talk about it, we'll do our normal assessment, we'll do our normal trades. Um, you know, uh, and depending on what the reason for it would be, you know, we'll have those, we'll have those discussions as we go forward. Okay, next on the line is Todd Halverson. Thanks, Todd Halverson of Florida Today with maybe a couple, but um, first of all, um, Leroy, I was wondering, I'm just kind of trying to gauge the significance of these tile dings. I mean, uh, what in your judgment is a potential that uh, these might cause uh, the need for a focused inspection? Uh, and I'm wondering whether this is something that uh, might require repairs or endanger the crew during reentry. I'm just trying to get a handle on uh, the overall significance of uh, these towel hits. Thanks. Okay. Well, um, Todd, what I would say is, you know, these are areas that we don't have enough data or analytical or photographic or otherwise. Yeah, we haven't done enough work yet to be able to determine whether or not there's um, there's any more uh, information or assessment that we need on these areas to include, first of all, um, focused inspection. Um, so that's what we're in the throes of, of doing that work right now. And the team, we're, we're going to, um, we're going to stay within ourselves. We're going to stay within our processes. We have very tried and true and, and proven um, processes and techniques for doing all this work. Um, I would tell you, as I said in the beginning, um, this isn't. This is not cause for alarm. It's not cause for for any concern. Um, we know how to deal with these things in terms of um, how to assess them. Um, we know that if we get to the point where we need some more data uh, for our assessment, um, we have a plan for going and doing that. We know how to go and do that. It's in the timeline to be able to go and do that with focus inspection. Um, and then to the other part of your question, I guess. I, I don't really want to speculate, Todd. Um, you know, I don't have any reason um, to uh, to do that at this point. We've got some more work to do in these areas. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to the team that's that's working really hard on these assessments uh, for me to do that. Um, and I don't think there'd really be any value added in me doing that. Um, I am I am not concerned, um, and and I'm and the, and myself and the team were certainly not alarmed by what we're seeing here. Um, my confidence is derived in, in knowing that we have uh, a highly skilled, very professional, very thorough uh, team. We've been through these kind of things before. Um, we understand the work that we need to go do, um, and, and we're very much in the midst of doing that work. And so um, we're going to take it one day at a time. We'll bring in the data as we're able to evaluate it through the MMT process and, and share that with you. Um, and so you'll be right there and step with us in terms of knowing what I know, um, and uh, and I, I don't want to I don't want to speculate um, on on the other part of your your question for today. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I I just wanted to ask you one other thing, and that is in regard to the final four EVAs of the uh, shuttle program. I can remember back in the early nineteen. Uh, 90s to mid 1990s, when Greg Harbaugh was the uh, chief of the EVA office, we there there was all this talk about the the wall of EVA and how difficult it was going to be to um, you know assemble the International Space Station. And I was wondering if you could describe for us um, you know what exactly that wall looked like then, and um, whether you have any surprise at all that. Um, Things have come off as um, well slickly as they have to date. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question, and I, you know, it's something that I personally have pondered quite a bit going back to uh, before return to flight. Um, uh, just a little story about that. You know, I I was down in Florida one time uh, during that return to flight process, and we went over into the SSPF where we have where at the time we had all of the space station hardware these various elements and, and nodes and, and large 
pieces of the space station that today are on orbit. Um, and they have sort of a catwalk area that you can walk along where you can have a really good vantage point of the floor and of the SSPF, which at the time was um, literally full of space station hardware and, and all these various pieces. And it really gave me pause thinking about, you know, because I'd been very much involved and in the throes of the return to flight uh, process um, and the things that we were doing with the shuttle to, to get ourselves ready to go fly. And, um, and it really made me stop and think about the task that we had in front of us because every one of those pieces of hardware, in most cases, almost every one, several of them anyway, we say it that way, it's a fair way to say it, um, involve one or more spacewalks to be able to assemble um, and, and check out and configure um, to get to the point with the space station as we know it today. And it seemed to me at the time to be an, an incredibly daunting task. Um, and so I thought a lot about that then. And since then, as we've kind of just done one mission at a time, um, we've worked through one spacewalk at a time. Um, our space station friends have, have done an unbelievable job um, working with our teams and, and uh, choreographing all these things and, and working every mission, every spacewalk of every mission, every potential contingency to, to the level of detail that just makes your eyes water. Um, and then they kind of just all, for the most part, came off, you know, not literally, but, you know, quite nearly almost without a hitch. And, um, you know, spacewalking is, is one of the most challenging um, things that we do. And it's one of the areas that we put a lot of emphasis on. Um, and so I had a lot, of, uh, a lot of thoughts about that going into the return to flight missions leading up to each one of them as we clicked off each mission leading up to where we are today, Todd. And, and um, you know, I, I wouldn't say, um, you know, surprise is not the word, but um, certainly it, it, it makes you think about what has been accomplished and, and the potential that was there for us to have some challenges and, and some things to overcome that we were fortunate to not have. And I, I say fortunate, but um, really that's the result in it, uh, of a lot of hard work uh, by a lot of people. Um, in terms of building the hardware, checking it out, processing it, getting ready to go. Uh, the teams that built the procedures and the techniques and spent all the time in the pool and in the control center and you know on and on and on and on and on. Um, so much work uh, has gone each, into each one of those missions uh, to make sure that we could handle any contingencies if they came up. And, and we just had a lot of good fortune and the hardware has really performed well. Um, and we've tried to take lessons learned from you know earlier times in, in both programs, really shuttle and station, and implement a lot of those things uh, as we as we set out to uh, to construct the station in earnest, because the, these were some pretty significant <laughs> significant tasks that we had to do. So, um, pretty amazing overall uh, when you look at what we have on orbit today. Um, we've said it over and over again. You kind of have to pinch yourself, um, and uh, it's something for the team to be really really proud of. Uh, and certainly the station is is a huge part of the of the shuttle's legacy. Okay, I believe that was all online. So are there any follow-ups here? Sure. Uh, Mark Caro for, uh, for Aviation Week. Uh, I just wonder if any thought or discussion was given to using any of the uh, space station spacewalk opportunities to do any look at the underside tile on Endeavor? Yeah, we're not there. Um, we're, that's that's uh, way on down the line from where we are right now. Um, if we had determined that we need to do anything additional or not. Um, so that's, uh, you know, if we're on step 10 of a thousand, that, that's like 700 something. and. Uh, so we're just we're just not to that point, quite honestly, Mark. Um, but the team is, you know, this team as well as I do, um, they're very creative, um, and uh, we know we have a lot of capability between what the shuttle offers to itself, 
um, for these kind of things, as well as what we have um, at when we're when we're at space station. And so we enjoy a lot of really uh, uh, great capability in that regard, and uh, and we'll leverage whatever it w uh, we we would need. But I don't anticipate anything like that in terms of what we're looking at here. Any more follow-ups? Clara Moskowitz again for Space.com. And I'm just wondering about the robotics work tomorrow to install the AMS and if you could speak to kind of big picture, just how difficult, um, challenging, and, and how much risk is involved in those robotic operations. Okay. Um, well, I, I, uh, I don't know that it's the most challenging robotics operations we've ever done. You know, um, the team uh, goes to a lot of effort to to make sure that when we choreograph these things, it's done in a way that, that we have off ramps and we have places where we can where we can stop and evaluate. Um, and so, from a contingency standpoint, you know, there's um, no stone unturned in that regard. Um, it's certainly a challenging operation. Anytime you're you're moving around, you know, large masses like this that have the kind of dimensions that the AMS have, and, and, and you're moving it from the shuttle payload bay, the cargo bay, um, to a specific place. Um, where then you need to hand it off and then move it to a specific place on the space station. You know, that there's a number of challenges involved in, with that. Um, the uh, different camera views that you need for the robotics operators, um, both on the shuttle and the station. So it's pretty involved, pretty complex. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't want to venture to say it, it's the most complicated or most complex or most difficult or most risky. They're all kind of unique in that regard. And uh, this one will be, uh, this one will be um, very exciting for the team to get, to get this work done tomorrow. And, uh, and I know there's a lot of folks around the world that are pretty interested in, in what we're doing here. So uh, we're really looking forward to it. Any more follow? -up? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and wrap up the briefing for this afternoon. Uh, coming up on NASA television, we will start airing the flight day highlights from flight day three. Those videos will begin at the top of the hour during the crew sleep shift starting at 4 p.m. Central Time. And then the shuttle crew is scheduled to awaken at 1.01 a.m. Central Time and uh, start that robotic work to install the Alpha Met Magnetic Spectrometer 2, uh, leading up to the station robotic arm installing it about uh, 2.41 a.m. Central Time that operation will begin. Thank you for joining us.